All right. Well, good morning or good afternoon. Um, good morning to Dr. Haldeman on the West Coast. And welcome to the Osher Center for Integrative Health Grand Rounds. My name is Peter Wayne, and I serve as the director for the Osher Center. Today, we're privileged to have Dr. Scott Haldeman present on Primary Spine Care, an initiative addressing the extreme health burden of spinal pain. But before introducing Dr. Haldeman, I'd like to share a few general announcements. First, I want to acknowledge that this is the first Grand Rounds to take place under our center's new name, Osher Center for Integrative Health. The decision to shift from integrative medicine to integrative health re reflects our evolving mission and our desire to shift away from more narrow medical, the more narrow medical focus of disease treatment and management to supporting more of a whole person health paradigm, where health includes wellness prevention as well as disease management and rehabilitation. I think that aligns well with Dr. Haldeman's uh, talk theme today. You can read more about the motivation for this change in our recent newsletter via a link that will be soon added to the chat feature in Zoom. Second, and aligned with the spirit of today's presentation, I want to remind our community that we're now soliciting applications for our Chiropractic Research Fellowship, which is generally funded by the NCMIC Foundation. This fellowship aims to advance chiropractic research through cultivating and mentoring exceptional candidates in a three-year postdoctoral program that's focused on development of skills to support a career as an independent researcher in clinical musculoskeletal health and pain management. And this is an incredible opportunity we're excited to offer. The application deadline is soon. It's November 1st. Um, the fellowship will begin on July 1st in 2024 and another link um, pointing you to more application guidelines and details will also be put in the chat room. And finally, some practical matters for today's lecture. If you wish to request CME credits, again, be on the lookout for another comment in the chat feature that's gonna give you all the instructions you need. And as you listen to Dr. Haldeman's presentation today, we encourage you to write questions for him in the Q&A feature. I'll be curating and collating them and I'll present them to him um, during the discussion phase after his lectures. So now it's my distinct um, pleasure to introduce our highly accomplished and distinguished speaker for today, Dr. Scott Haldeman. Dr. Haldeman holds, holds the positions of clinical professor in the Department of Neurology um, at the University of California, Irvine, and he's also a visiting professor at Southern California University of Health Sciences. He's a graduate of the University of Pretoria in South Africa, where he received his bachelor's and master's degrees in science, the Palmer Chir uh, College of Chiropractic, where he received his doctorate in chiropractic. And unusually, along with that, um, he received uh, an MD and a PhD um, from the University of British Columbia in Canada. He's completed his internships at the Vancouver General Hospital Residency in Neurology at the University of California, Irvine, um, and a fellowship in electrodiagnosis at the Long Beach Veterans Hospital. So tremendous depth and richness of training. Dr. Haldeman's the founder and the current president of the World Spine Care, of World Spine Care, which is a nonprofit organization endorsed by the Decade of the Bone and Joint, an initiative of the World Health Organization. This charity has the goal of helping people in underserved regions of the world who suffer from spinal disorder and we'll be hearing um, about some of that work today. Dr. Haldeman's um, has published over 240 articles or book chapters. He's authored eight textbooks. He's been on editorial boards of eight professional and scientific journals, so quite a distinguished career. And that work has been acknowledged with a number of awards. And here's a brief list of them. The David Selby Award by the North American Spine Society, the Patenj uh, Distinguished Lecture Award from Michigan State University, the Bone and Joint Decade Global Alliance Distinguished Service Award, and finally, the Dr. Luce Bertelli Lifetime of Leadership Award. So without any further ado, I'll stop talking and please join me in welcoming Dr. Haldeman. Thanks, Peter. Uh, this is a real privilege and an honor to be able to speak to uh, at the Osher Center now. Congratulations on the change of name and the movement. I think that's the right direction to go right now. Uh, I also want to thank uh, uh, Matt Kowalski for helping to organize and contact me uh, uh, for this presentation. 
Uh, I'm going to move right into the presentation uh, at this time. Uh, it's got a lot of slides, a lot of activity, and we'll see if how, how fast it goes. And I apologize for if it goes a little too fast. And my slide just didn't move like it did before. There we go. Conflicts of interest, bias and data. Uh, I'm currently on no salary, no speakers fees, no investments or patents, no industry relationships. I do get an occasional check of 20 or 30 dollars from uh, book royalties. Uh, I get travel cost reimbursement from conference lectures, but no other uh, reimbursement. Uh, my biases, and I think biases are important in any kind of lecture like this. We have charitable donations to World Spine Care from Health Canada from the Musk and NCMIC and Skull Foundations to World Spine Care Charities. And some of the work I'm talking about has been funded by these organizations. Uh, I'm gonna quote a lot of data in this time. Uh, some is old, some is new, some is not generalizable, some is biased uh, due to personal research. Uh, I believe that when pr one presents one's personal research, it's inevitably biased. Uh, I'll tend to identify which is which uh, to give you some feel for where we're coming from. The presentation is going to be as follows. We have a current model of care. We're taking care of people with spine care, at least in the high income countries of the world, North America and the United States. The question is, is that current of care, a model of care working? And if so, uh, why should we even care about it? And then talk about the promise of evidence-based guidelines. And then I'll move on to the Global Spine Care Initiative and World Spine Care. And finally, an argument in favor, I hope, of a primary spine care clinician or uh, center. So the current model of care, it basically comes like this. If I'm a patient, who do I see if I have spinal pain and what are my options? Well, I can see a family physician. Low back pain is number two or five. Some 27 million minutes. This is old data from Biggis and Dale, uh, a number of years old, uh, but it probably has not changed much. Next pain uh, is high and 10 million visits a year. And spine pain in these studies was three to 4% of all outpatient visits uh, in the United States. You could go to a surgeon. Uh, spinal pain is the number one reason for visit orthopedic surgeon, number one visit reason for visiting a neurosurgeon, and the number three reason for any elective surgery. Again, fairly old data, but I think uh, it's probably consistent with today's physical therapists. Well, low back pain is the number one complaint, and neck pain is the number four complaint, but spine pain only represents 30 to 40 percent of outpatient visits to a physical therapist in the U.S. That is a couple of different set data. Siobhan is a little more uh, recent coming up with similar opinions. You can go to a chiropractor and chiropractic, low back pain is the number one complaint, neck pain is the number two complaint, and spine pain basically represents 90% of all visits uh, uh, and the reason why people go to chiropractors. One of the few groups who focus almost solely on spine and spine related problems. You can go to what used to be called complementary and alternative medicine and still called in many settings. Uh, Eisenberg, in his original paper, which is when the last time I was speaking at Osher, um, low, no, low back pain was number two and neck pain was number one, but they incorporated chiropractic within this complementary and alternative medicine group. And these days, it's often taken out as made as part of mainstream professions. Uh, however, recently, the CDC uh, in, uh, looked at uh, why people uh, or the conditions for which people uh, go to see a CAM practitioner. And I have this a little graph down here from them. And back pain is still number one, neck pain number two, joint pain number three, arthritis number four. We're talking a substantial reason why people go out of mainstream medicine uh, and healthcare uh, to seek alternative or complementary or integrative, whichever word one wants to use, um, uh, type of treatment. 
Opioids, well, low back pain is the number one indication for opi prescribing opioids, reason for prescribing opioids, and up to 50% of all opioid prescriptions are for low back pain. Neck pain is the number four indication, and some 17% of users um, uh, have opioid. And again, a couple of studies, a little dated, but I, I've looked at, tried to find some really good up-to-date uh, data, and I'm not able to note that. But what I did do a few years ago is to look in Southern California at the treatments that I, as a patient, could reasonably consider. And I put them in columns. Oops. The columns included storefront window, pharmaceuticals, manual therapies, exercise modalities, psychological injections, minimally invasive surgery, lifestyle changes, or CAM treatments at that time. And I listed everything that I saw advertised. And what it became obvious is that this is similar to a supermarket. I had over 200 different potential things. If I'm a patient, I'm looking for something to treat my back pain. I have over 200 options in Southern California. This is very difficult. A patient is in pain. I'm in pain. My cognition, mood, and coping is affected. I have all of these options, and at each aisle is a salesperson thinking that, telling me repeatedly that they have the best treatment for back pain. The medical scientific terminology is difficult to follow, and I have to lift with the consequences of my decision. It's like trying to make wise food choices when shopping in a foreign supermarket with incomprehensible food labels on an empty stomach. It just doesn't work. And it just leaves the patient confused. As a clinician and provider, I have limited time to see a patient and answer problems, limited time to keep up with the latest research on each treatment approach for all spinal disorders. And I have a marked difference in the education understanding all of us here who treat patients, each one of us went to a different type of school, received a different kind of education. And so the question is, what do I do as a clinician when I'm stuck with 200 potential options? If I'm a policymaker, there are limited funds available, but I'm responsible to ensuring the care is available to my clients. I have limited understanding the value of these spine interventions, and I rely on a clinical director who may have training in one specialist an orthopedic surgeon, perhaps a chiropractor, perhaps a family physician who has no more real experience than I do. And the question is, what do I do as a policymaker? So the question is, if that is the standard, if that is how we're working today, is it working? Well, if we look at the cost of back pain in the United States, there's a, a, a recent article by Dillerman, just a couple of years old, Low back pain and neck pain are the highest amount of healthcare spending with an estimated 134 billion. Now, this is just healthcare spending. Spending. I did an article before that. We estimate that this is 15 to 20 percent of the total cost of spine pain. The rest is in disability and lost income. Other musculoskeletal disorders were 129 billion, and the second greatest, diabetes and ischemic heart disease, were distant third and fourth. Martin and Dale did a really interesting study a few years ago. They looked at the increase in expenditures for back and neck pain and noted they increased 60% over a period 1997 to 2005 and included everything, prescription medication, narcotics, outpatient, inpatient, chiropractic, physiotherapy, because everybody went up, narcotics especially. With this increase in 60% in the amount of money we were spending on back pain, Physical function during that same period from back and neck pain increased from 20 to 27, 24%, almost 25%. In other words, there was the increased amount of money, the increased costs resulted in worse health and greater levels of disability. And this is not just uh, in, 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 around here. This uh, camper just two years ago, did a study, uh, look, did a systematic review of 26 studies from 195,000 patients. 
Less than 20% of these patients with low back pain received evidence-informed care uh, uh, from their family physician. One in four patients with low back pain received uh, was referred for imaging in a family practice and one in three in emergency room. And up to 30% of patients with low back pain were prescribed opioids in family practice and 60% in emergency room. This is mostly in the United States. But in South Africa, 90% of primary care patients uh, with uh, low back pain received only pain medication, no other form of treatment at all. In Iran, patients with acute or chronic low back pain went directly to the orthopedic surgeon, neurosurgeon, rheumatologist. In Cambodia, 41% of patients with low back pain were admitted to hospital. In Brazil, 53% of patients with low back pain went to the emergency room or admitted to hospital. This is from Foster's Lancet article in 2018. And it shows that this problem of not complying with evidence-based care and sending people to the most expensive treatment is uh, universal. If we look at the prescription crisis, remember 50%, maybe 70% of, of all prescriptions were for neck and back pain. The average of 44 people died. This is from CDC, uh, or the National Center, yeah, CDC. On an average of 44 people died each, di are dying today each day uh, from overdoses from prescription only medication. 16,000 deaths in one year in 2020. Prescription opioids were involved in 24% of all overdose deaths. 16% increase in prescription opioids involved deaths rent from 19, 2019 to 2020. And remember, there are 75,000 opioid toxicity deaths in 2021. And many, apart from the 25%, uh, 24% due to prescription overdose, many of those people who ended up taking fentanyl or one of the more uh, non-regulated opioids did so in order to deal with the consequences of having a prescribed opioid. So what our model of care is today is we got the general physicians who have no spine care training. Uh, in my medical training, I had a total of 10 hours for, on the spine, and that included anatomy, physiology, diagnosis, and treatment. Uh, and these clinics and, and general physicians are doing their best job they can, but they do not have the training and they are prescribed and not working according to evidence-based guidelines. Almost everybody then is filtered down into district hospitals where there's some minimal spine care or senior into tertiary hospitals where they end up with the most expensive and most comprehensive spine pain. Basically, the current model of care in most communities around the world today is that the lowest cost people of prevention of, of spine pain and disability is hardly ever addressed. There's relatively little spine care. Very few patients go to primary spine care. A lot of patients go to secondary spine care, and most people get the most expensive and least effective care for ordinary spine care apart from advanced spine care. We're talking about the wrong care, going to the wrong person at the wrong place at the wrong time. So the question then, why should we even care about this? That's the way it's worked. It's always been like this. It's kind of something we deal with and we're comfortable with. Uh, so why do we care about it? Well, let's look and see. Uh, the Global Burden of Disease, which is a World Health Organization associated uh, uh, health data, health metrics group, uh, published its recent data in 2019. And they, they preference the prevalence of low back pain just was 569 million people. But this, what was profound in this thing is that this is increasing. And from 1990 to 2019, it had increased by almost 50%. NIH, uh, NHIS study in 2018 noted that 75.8 million Americans, or 29, almost 30% of all individuals between age 18 and older, 
were suffering from low back pain if they were or talk would would answer yes when asked if they had low back pain. We published a paper recently on U.S. workers, uh, and this is just the working population, uh, which means it's eliminated all the disabled people and, and the young and the old. And we still had 25% of U.S. workers who were suffering from chronic low back pain at any one point. And the lifetime prevalence of back pain has and it depends on which study and which how people the data was collected, but it was somewhere between 40 and 80 percent with marked variation. And I, one speaker I went to, one epidemiologist said, it really is 100 percent. And the 20 percent who say they've never had back pain before have just forgotten that they had it. The difficulty with this is that chronic low back pain globally in a, in a study by Jackson, a systematic review of the literature, uh, it was about 18%. But in chronic, and this is just chronic low back pain, not the prevalence of acute low back pain, but chronic low back pain. Uh, but in, in uh, low and middle income countries, it was significantly higher. And when we look at neck pain, uh, we have this data, the global burden of disease, which is the study here, showed that 233 million people globally had neck pain and that it increased from 79%. But when we did the bone and joint decade task force on neck pain associated disorder, which I had the privilege of chairing, um, the neck pain in the past year, if you looked at the various studies out there, was between 30 and 50%. And what was surprising is that up to 40% of children and adolescents also had neck pain. And 5% of them had severe neck pain. And neck pain limiting, uh, limiting activities in adults was up to 10, 2 to 12%, depending on the study. Now, we all have back and neck pain, big deal. We can survive it. But I want you to look at the global disability statistics. This is from uh, Lancet study and from the Global Burden of Disease. Globally in 2019, 2.41 billion individuals had some level of disability. That's getting close to 30% of the population of the world. And it contributed to 310 million years lived with disability. This number had increased by 63% from 1990, similar study in 1990. The disease area that contributed the most was musculoskeletal disorders, 71% uh, was musculoskeletal disorders. That's 1.71 billion people. And of the musculoskeletal disorders, low back pain was the most prevalent condition in 134 of 204 countries. And, in, uh, and by far the majority of countries, the number one cause of disability was low back pain with neck pain being number four or number six. To make it worse, disability disproportionately impacts women, the elderly, rural communities, the lowest income community, quint, uh, lowest income quintine of the population and lower income countries. The most vulnerable people in the world are those most likely to have back pain. In the last study in 2019, and spinal disorders have a greater impact or burden of disease, the disability associated life years, uh, Dallies, then HIV AIDS, depression, malaria, lung cancer, Alzheimer's disease, congenital birth defects, chronic kidney disease, and other musculoskeletal disorders. It is the most important component of the uh, burden of disease. In the USA now, if we expand uh, what we're talking about, back pain is number one, other MSK is number uh, Four, headache disorders, they call it migraine, they're now calling it headache disorders, a lot of which come from uh, chronic pain or spine pain, and neck pain is number six. So we're talking, if you look at the, and opioids is number eight, if we look at the top 10, at least five of the components have some relationship to, to spine disorders. And this impacts every, everybody who has it. Interesting Australia study by Schofield, ages 
45 to 64 who were had retired earlier, those people who retired early. 79% had lower income, 100% had less taxes, 2,100% more government support. And this cost the government in lost individual earnings, welfare payments, taxation revenues, and amounted to a huge loss in global uh, in, in gross uh, GDP. But it doesn't, low back pain doesn't stand by itself. It is it has a comorbid association. We published a study a few years with Dr. DeLuca being primary in Australia, looking at women uh, who were self-reported spine pain. They had a substantial and significant increased comorbid diabetes, cardiovascular disease, pulmonary disease, cancer, mental disorder, obesity, and overweight. We've just published a paper uh, this year showing that if you have uh, heart condition, hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and the blue is the general population, neck red is neck pain, um, the, the uh, gray is uh, back pain, and the orange is back and neck pain, you see a substantial increase in the likelihood of having these diseases if you also have low back pain. Now, those are cross-sectional studies. You can't give a causation component, but we also just published a paper looking at major depression over a nine-year MIDAS follow-up study, and back pain at baseline was prospectively associated with major depression, and major depression at baseline is prospectively associated with back pain. And just last month, I saw another study by uh, Suri and his colleagues on a GWAS, which showed that back pain uh, increases the risk of type 2 diabetes in a prospective longitudinal uh, cross-sectional study, a uh, case control study. And two studies have shown that if you have back pain and over the age of 70, you have a 13% li increased likelihood of mortality or cause mortality. So this is more than just simply my back hurts. So what is the solution? The providence of evidence-based guidelines. These are some of the guidelines that I've been involved with over the past 30 years and uh, published guidelines. And I'm not gonna have time to go over all of them. But we have a lot of evidence, not always good evidence, but a lot of evidence. Over 1,200 randomized controlled trials on various non-surgical, non-pharmaceutical care. And these are manipulation, exercise, cognitive behavioral therapy, education, yoga, tai chi, or qigong. The first study was in 1994, first guidelines, and came up with education, medication, manipulation, some home heat and rest, and exercises. The World Health Organization, for the first time, has decided to get involved in back pain, and they're developing guidelines. I'm fortunate to be on one of the panels. Uh, but it hasn't published yet. There is a package of interventions for rehabilitation low back pain, which came out in 2023, uh, just recently, and which I've also been part of. And in that pa package, it, oral NSAIDs, joint mobilization, spinal manipulative therapy, physical exercises, education, and cognitive behavior were recommended. And this is similar to everybody else now. The American College of Physicians, the Fa American College of Family Physicians, um, and uh, GLAD and so on are all saying massage, acupuncture, manipulation, Tigon, don't, ex don't, don't uh, it, do too much imaging, uh, don't use opioids. This includes the Bone and Joint Decade Task Force and Neck Pain that I chaired, I told you about, published in three different journals or some 16 odd papers. And again, it came out with a similar idea, manipulation, supervised exercise, manual therapy, acupuncture, did, did include acupuncture, and some low level laser and the NSAIDs analgesics. But before recommending it, we should start thinking about what uh, the harms are. Uh, and this is the one that surprised me. This is from Davis and Robson's in the British Journal of General Practition, uh, Practice um, just a couple of uh, few years ago. Uh, and it says from the first day of use, all NSAIDs increase the risk of gastrointestinal. GI bleeding, myocardial infarction, and stroke. Excess risk of seven to nine non-fatal and two fatal cardiovascular events per 
1,000 patients. And people over the age of 65, it doubles the risk of acute kidney injury. And they can precipitate bronchospasm in 5 to 10% of adults. This is data uh, which we looked at at the neck pain task force, but not in as much detail uh, as uh, Davidson Robinson did. As far as the non-surgical uh, management of back and neck pain, the biggest issue which always comes up is the issue of vertebral basilar stroke and chiropractic care. Well, while we were doing the neck pain task force, uh, we uh, Cassidy and his colleagues uh, looked at all eligible incident uh, vertebral basilar artery strokes admitted to Ontario hospitals over a nine-year period. And there was no excessive risk of vertebral basilar artery stroke associated with chiropractic care. This is both the case control and case crossover study. Uh, I was uh, co-authored a study with Dr. Cassidy on the carotid artery stroke, came up with exactly the same conclusion. Uh, and it was felt at that time that the likelihood, the fact that some of these cases occurred after seeing a chiropractor was likely due to the fact that patients with early dissection uh, were seeking symptoms of care prior to developing their strokes. Since then, there've been two additional studies, one by Kozlov and his colleagues, looking at, uh, again, a case crossover study on a commercial and Medicare Advantage populations, and another one we just carried, I just carried out with Dr. Whedon, uh, which looked at uh, the Medicare population, both came up with a similar study. And basically we're saying is, this is the explanation. People with dissection end up with a thrombolic embolic event and a stroke, a certain percentage of them. But they also end up with neck pain. And that neck pain may send them to a family physician or emergency room or to a chiropractor because chiropractors take care of neck pain. But this does not appear to impact the natural progression of the dissection. It occurs despite the fact that the patient was seen by a family physician and chiropractor. Admittedly, neither of these clinicians were able to document or decide to, to determine that, that this was going on, but it's not unusual because the type of neck pain is not different from everyday neck pain. But there are also adverse events from yoga. There's a study showing that uh, one in five yoga people have uh, musculoskeletal effects and uh, acupuncture. A whole bunch of things have been reported, but also single events. Uh, only 117 patients in this literature review by Dr. Zhu over a 12 year period. And they were infections in pneumococcus, uh, uh, pneumothorax and spinal cord and peripheral nerve injuries, probably all by sticking either dirty needles in people or sticking the needle where it shouldn't be uh, because all the controlled clinical trials found no adverse events, serious adverse events. So the conclusion is the accepted evidence-based treatments for back and neck pain today are triage and avoiding unnecessary imaging and testing, exercise, increased activity of any type, supervised yoga, tai chi, doesn't seem to make too much difference. Education, self-care, reassurance, advice, no smoking, manipulation and mobilization and massage, acupuncture plus or minus razor, cognitive behavioral therapy with mindfulness and social uh, psychosocial therapy, and NSAIDs plus or minus acetaminophen plus or minus antidepressants, depending on which guideline one looks at. And if you do this, there's evidence that it could be beneficial. We, I'm involved now in four different studies. One, reducing the barriers to conservative spine care to minimize opioid exposure. The next one is to look at wait times, opioid prescriptions and imaging. Uh, if you have a, a chiropractic clinic uh, or non-surgical non component and Optum Labs project, which is just completed on the management and outcome of neck pain with and without headache. And a study that we published uh, just two years ago on the manipulation, uh, and we noted it reduced the amount of long-term risk of adverse drug events amongst older Medicare patients. So, okay, if we accept this, if we accept that gui guidelines are probably affected, then we have to look, why isn't it changing the, the care? Uh, Foster in his Lancet article said, guidelines without effective strategies to implementation, uh, to implement their recommendations have had no effect and this is the reality of it. 
we're not just talking about something in the top corner of low back pain and neck pain. We're talking about thoracic pain, sciatica, cervicogenic headache, comorbid trauma, cancer, coli, equina. This is a complicated field. If a person walks into the door, it's a complicated field. So we decided to look at underserved communities around the world and started the World Spine Care Program that, uh, that Peter described early on. And this is a nonprofit charity registered in the United States, Canada, and the United Kingdom to help people with uh, underserved community. It's recognized by the World uh, Health Organization as a um, model of success. And you can go on the web, uh, WHO website and see it. These are our clinics, one in Botswana. We've had over 60 volunteers. We've seen over 60,000 uh, patients. This is in Northern Canada, where we now have a grant. Uh, in the small community, uh, uh, First Nations community in Cross Lakes. Uh, we have one in Dominican Republic, actually two clinics in Dominican Republic now. We have one in Ghana, and we have one in India uh, at, in, in uh, uh, the Mahatma Gandhi uh, uh, University Hospital. It was from this that we developed this, the Global Spine Care Initiative. This was an initiative to, do, to look for an innovative, integrative model of care to improve the management of spinal disorders low back with the goal of reducing disability. And it was published in uh, European Spine Journal with some 16 articles in 1918. It was a Delphi process, 68 clinicians and scientists from 24 countries around the world, including low and middle income countries, three level Delphi process, came up with a model of care dividing uh, spinal disorders into serious pathology, spinal deformity, neurological symptoms, pain, isolated pain, so-called non-specific back pain, and prevention. And in each one of these, uh, there was a, a description. These were then subdivided into acute, uh, acute or chronic, progressive, moderate or severe pain, uh, or mild pain as in subclasses. And for each one of the major class and the subclasses, there were a list of treatment options in the form of flashcards. And these are stuck up in each uh, of the treatment rooms in all of our um, World Spy Care clinics around the world. And so you can see for each one of these, this is for a class 3A, and here's how to assess the patient, what treatments the evidence suggests might be beneficial and self-care possibilities for, by the patient as well. So the importance, but what became very evident was the importance of a community-based primary spine care clinician. In other words, somebody has to be doing this. What we find is we, we had, we've had education uh, components. Um, uh, we put on courses in Botswana. We put on courses in India and courses in Nepal uh, to describe uh, this process. However, if you're teaching somebody who has only five minutes to spend with a patient, which is the average in many low-income countries for a family physician, or people such as physical therapists who have to deal with neurological disability, musculoskeletal disability, trauma disability, cancer disability, as well as spine disability, and try and teach them all to, to uh, deal with this, it just, it, it over, it's overwhelming. So we need some primary spine care clinician, somebody out there, let's call it similar to a dentist who deals with all the teeth and all the complexities of dental care. They have to coordinate, be knowledgeable and coordinate an evidence-based comprehensive spine care. We're looking at a process where the majority of people receive the cheapest health care in the form of uh, community and self-care programs. If you have a problem, you go to the lowest cost uh, clinical pro uh, clinician out there. The primary spine care clinician doesn't order x-rays, doesn't order pharmaceuticals, except maybe some ANSIDs, and can provide all the necessary care. Only those few people who are some of the people who need more advanced care are sent for x-rays or imaging or um, for specialist medical specialist care if there's a possibility of serious 
a, a complicating disease and, and uh, may require some coordinated professional care. And the very few end up with the most expensive care, uh, namely complex spinal disorders, trauma, uh, fractures, infections, cancers, uh, uh, deformity, etc. So the model looks something like this. Primary spine care, the individuals, a patient, there's a, you have a community-based care, primary spine care, and secondary and tertiary spine care. Community-based, the patient have concerns, they have access to information which helps them to make decision where to go. Many of them, most of them, if not all of them, end up in a, a, a in a primary spine care where they have a triage, the history and examination, diagnosis and intervention, uh, and all the non-surgical interventions, and a referral as, as soon as is needed into secondary or primary spine care. A close integration of primary spine care with secondary tertiary spine care and the self-care in the community. Another model or perception of this is they have a primary or core uh, integrative spine care group that you have, they create an education program for the community public health uh, uh, resources with print media and electronic survey and community based with clinics and emergency room and nurse practitioners, police and ambulance, et cetera. The referrals are back and forth between secondary spine care on a regular basis. They are sent to primary spine care for x-rays or basic rehabilitation or surgical, uh, first level surgical uh, care, or uh, to a tertiary spine care when necessary for subspecialty medical care, uh, advanced diagnostic MRI scans, et cetera, and advanced surgical care and advanced rehabilitation. The requirements for uh, Spine clinician is evidence-based practitioner, able to triage the patient with uh, spine concern and recognize emergent conditions, take a comprehensive history and differential diagnosis, perform MSK and neurological examinations, order and interpret uh, diagnostic tests, manage and treatment of spine care with non-invasive interventions and manual therapy, Etc. cetera, screen for psychological and other care, educate patients on self-care and prevention, understand rehabilitation, interventional treatments, manage patients over the long term, uh, coordinate care with other healthcare providers and using and track meaningful outcome measures. Conclusion then is that I, I'm not convinced that we can change by a simple education program the care given by an over, uh, currently overworked, overloaded medical um, and, and uh, current medical health care system in the United States, or for that matter, anywhere in the world, that we have to have either a service, if we can't find a clinician who can do primary care by itself, at least a, a team that can provide all the services of spinal care and that is based in the community, on the corner, in the shops. Right now, the only group that seems to be considering this model are two or three of the chiropractic institutions around the world. And they are gradually expanding this idea that, uh, that at least the chiropractor should participate. However, there are only 100,000 chiropractors in the world. There aren't nearly enough to even begin impacting this a problem which where we're talking about, uh, you know, 1.5 billion people who are disabled from back pain. Uh, and so we need to advance or increase the number of clinicians who are capable of doing this. If anybody has any further information on World Spine Care or want full copies of the Global Spine Care Initiative papers, you can go to www w.worldspinecare.org or to the globalspinecareinitiative.org, both of which have the papers online for you to download. I want to thank again, uh, Peter Wayne and Matt Kowalski for uh, the invitation and, uh, and everything and, and really enjoyed being with you. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Haldeman, and it's incredible to see the arc of your work and all your experience, not just informing academic work, but reaching out into the global communities and doing some really important grassroots work. So there's a bunch of interesting questions here. I'll try to 
pool them together and 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 um and and offer them to you for your comments. One that I'm going to just start with is, you know, you you emphasize the sort of the multiple more comorbidities that are associated with chronic musculoskeletal pain, but you and you've also suggested some therapies, um, some combinations of therapies that could be bundled or offered together. Offered together, I'm wondering it still feels like there's somewhat of a shotgun approach there. We've got all these therapies for these very complex conditions. Um, are there ways of drilling deeper? Are there subtypes um, or um, ways that we can get more towards personalized treatment so that in a clinic where you offer five or six therapies, um, it's really clear, oh, this person should probably start with, with spinal manipulation or maybe not, maybe they should start with some acupuncture or massage. Uh, have you gotten further in the evidence to sort of define how we triage people more specifically? Yeah, once you have a, a diagnosis of nonspecific low back pain, uh, there's a lot of debate and discussions, a lot of people who think they can figure it out. But in reality, we we don't have the tools to figure out uh, what's wrong, what's actually causing the pain generated. A wonderful article in the last uh, spine line from the North American Spine Society by a, a uh, uh, in, interventional uh, physiatrist who said, you know, he can't do it. Uh, it can't be done. On the other hand, we do have some information uh, from the tiles. One thing it's, that that's useful is to ask the patient what they think will help them the most and what they believe. There's articles, there are a couple of articles that have shown that if, if, if the randomized control trials, and if you ask the patient in front, one was on acupuncture and, and manipulation, and he asked, asked the patient, which would you prefer? Those people who preferred manipulation got a much better response to manipulation than those people who preferred acupuncture, and those who preferred acupuncture got a much better response to acupuncture than those people who, who didn't mm. recommend it. So, I, I think increasingly we're talking about a patient-centered care. Yeah, you don't, we're not the prescribers of the care because we're not that smart yet. Maybe we, we can make recommendations, but, but we have to work with the patient closely. The same with exercise. You know, you, putting everybody into an exercise program, which uh, looks exactly the same, sitting in a big hall and everybody was separate. There are some people who like who do better with yoga or qigong or tai chi, uh, or uh, even going to a gym, or swimming, or horse riding. I mean, there there are studies that show that all of these things uh, uh, can benefit a substantial number of people. So when you talk about exercise, you have to talk to the patient and say, "We have these options available. Which one do you want?" As opposed to saying, "I believe I'm the great." believer uh you know i i have the answers and i can tell you which one you have to go to uh, and if we do that i think we'll find higher better results i think yeah i think this is really at the center of patient-centered care now is yeah that the patient brings a lot of knowledge and um, should be included in this decision process so and and there's data to show that that's the way we all would ought to be doing yeah there's a, a series of questions around um, this and I'll, I'll I'll put a few of them out there and then you can navigate your answer around them. Um, but one is, given all these guidelines, um, why is there so little uptake on them? And uh, in uh, in relation to that, are there any um, structured programs um, that could provide formal training for primary spine care, as you've described it? Um, and related to that is. Um, is your best way to motivate current primary care physicians to use or refer um, formally trained and certified primary care, uh, primary spine practitioners? Uh, it, it, I mean, we're talking about the beginning of a movement, hopefully a movement. Um, it, it's very difficult. There are relatively, uh, as I say, there are some chiropractic institutions who are actually using primary spine care there's courses out there some of variable quantities so, you know we're seeing some for sale people a lot of the colleges and so on and funny there's some physical therapists at the doctorate level who are spine care physical therapists who are starting to think in terms 
of being a pure spine care center as opposed to a general physiotherapy center uh, or rehabilitation center. Uh, we're seeing a little bit of that in the hospital base, uh, but it, this is a concept which is really just starting to, to gain some traction over the last few years. Um, the hope is, at least my hope is that it'll continue to, to grow. Uh, but even in chiropractic, uh, there's some reluctance to assume that the only thing they treat are back and neck pain. You know, is that just a spine problem as opposed to everything else. With the comorbidities, that allows some variation of that. But we have to be, uh, uh, we don't have an answer as to how to train family physicians and others to be more evidence-based. I have a question. Um, in many of our discussions of integrative medicine and healthy aging, we, we focus much more on the older end of the spectrum. But you mentioned prevention and you mentioned children early on in one of your slides. And I'm wondering <laughs> how some of these ideas of prevention are relevant to adolescents. You know, for example, I've seen some really provocative studies showing that wearing backpacks with way too many books in it when you're six years old is not good for your spine and can have long-term impact. Same thing staring at little iPhones and computers. And with all of the lack of physical activity, the increased psychosocial stress, I can only imagine that musculoskeletal burdens are gonna be greater, but it seems like an archeological dig to start working on these cases when people are in their 50s, 60s, and 70s. Um, have you given some thought into sort of early on um, preventative spinal care for, especially for younger people? Yeah, I, I, yes, the, the answer, you know, and, and there's some, some serious talk about it. It's very difficult. Uh, the, the single most important thing probably for all of us, I mean, from day one till day 91, uh, is exercise and activity. Uh, there's, uh, it's very clear that this is the new magic treatment for pain of all sorts, but specifically back and neck pain. Uh, uh, it, and it doesn't seem to make too much difference what the, act, what the exercise is or the activity is, but lack of ex lack of activity, which is what happens when you have computers and, you know, I'm not walking around in the audience, I'm sitting solid in a chair right now for an hour, whereas if I was lecturing by person, mm -hmm. I'd be walking around the audience, had to walk into the room from a hotel, you know, down the way. Uh, that's That's gone away now. So you have to be much more active in that. The other is the strong psychological or psychosocial component of uh, musculoskeletal pain and musculoskeletal pathology. Um, and there's the, the data on this is growing every year that we, we cannot see or take people with spinal problem and think that this is being caused by a lesion in the spine. This is being caused by a whole person problem a problem of their general diet, their, their diet, their, uh, act, their activity, and their psychosocial environment. And uh, sometimes that can get so severe as to require a psychologist or a use of an antidepressant uh, as part of the treatment protocols. Uh, but yes, this is why I'm, I'm convinced that if we want to do this, we have to have this somebody who can focus in on this <clears throat> whole person concept in the environment yeah yeah again a perfect match to the initiatives going on around whole person health integrative health etc yeah. um and i think that that response addresses some of the other questions about why are we seeing such an increase in prevalence and it sounds to me like physical inactivity is is really shifting in our society due to the way we work and meet and, and our lifestyles and um and i can only imagine that with more globalization, there's just more awareness of all things to be stressed about. Um, so um, I think we will stop right there unless you have some final comments that you wanna make and then I can make some um, comments to just wrap us up. I'm good, thank you. Well, thank you again for such a thoughtful and comprehensive um, perspective. I think there are just so few people like you who've been trained in spinal care as a chiropractor, as a neurologist, uh, as a public health person working at the global scale that can really paint this picture and start to 
entice us with this really promising model that hopefully will guide research um, to inform those models, um, but also the training so that we have the people that can deliver that. So, so thank you for that. Um, I wanna just end with a few uh, general comments. Again, I wanna remind people that um, our fellowship is receiving applications. Please go to our website, oshercenter.org, um, and please consider um, this as Dr. Haldeman has already um, made very clear. We need people who are clinician researchers that can think about this and, and be the leaders in the future. Um, I wanna invite you all to um, two lectures next month that are gonna be very exciting. One is our standard uh, grand rounds, which is gonna be on November 7th and led by Dr. Marilyn, excuse me, <clears throat> Dr. Marilyn Moy from the Boston VA, who's a regular co collaborator with uh, Dr. Gloria Ye and myself on COPD and exercise. And that should be a really exciting and important timely talk. And then we have a special lecture next month. Uh, it's a, every three years we rotate. Um, and this one we're hosting Dr. Evan Thompson, who's a world renowned philosopher and cognitive neuroscientist from the University of British Columbia. And he'll be presenting what's called the Harvard Medical School Distinguished Lecture in Mind-Body Research and Health. And this is jointly presented by the Benson Henry Institute, our Osher Center, and the Center for Mindfulness Compassion um, based at the Cambridge Health Alliance. And Dr. Evan, um, Dr. Thompson's talk is gonna be called Mindfulness Meditation as Embodied Cognition, A View from Cognitive Science. You can register for these events, um, sign up for our newsletter, learn more about our OSHA programs, and even make a donation to support the OSHA Center at oshacenter.org. So thank you again, uh, Dr. Haldeman, and thank you to our whole audience for um, your uh, attention and participation today.